Well, hello, everybody. It's such a joy to be with you tonight and uh, to enjoy this moment where we can reflect on the story of Dr. Deo. It's always special for me to be here in the Brooklyn campus because, in essence, that's where the st story started for Liana myself about 26 years ago. In 1992, we had the privilege of arriving here with our two young children and uh, navigating this challenge of leading a church that had gone through a crisis. It was about 360 people that were dazed, uncertain about the future that were left in the church. And uh, we knew that God had to help us. I had never led a church before, and I arrived here, I was young, I still had hair, <laughs> life was good, and we knew that God needed to help us. I felt like a David that came from nowhere and suddenly had this responsibility to lead. But in a very short space of time, we sensed the grace of God upon the ministry. As a matter of fact, in two years, 1,300 people joined the ministry. And so things were starting to happen for us. We were excited. We started to run multiple services. And uh, I was reflecting on this one afternoon as I was preparing for a leadership meeting in 1994. In my study, I was preparing for this meeting and just thought I'd read some scripture. I opened up the Bible and it fell open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's the story there where Paul reflects on the gifts of the Spirit. I'd read that portion so many times, knew it well. But as I read it, it was as if suddenly I was truly reading the Bible. I don't know if you read the Bible that way, that sometimes when you read it, you know, now you're reading it. And there was this one phrase that stood out. To some are given a gift of faith. And as I was sitting in my study, reflecting on what had happened over the last two years with so much momentum and energy and excitement within the church, I, I was thinking about how blessed I was that we could have had faith for this to happen. It was in that moment that I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me so distinctly, saying, do you remember that Two years ago, many people did not believe this church would rise up again and become an influence within this city and within this community, but you believed it. Tears were streaming down my cheeks, and, and I was saying, yes, Lord, it's true, I believed it. It was then when I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, that was not your faith, it was a gift of faith. I suddenly became aware that I had been empowered to trust God beyond my natural ability to believe. Well, as I was reflecting on that, God dropped something into my spirit that deeply affected my life and has changed the course for this ministry. I distinctly heard God say, I now give you faith for a city. I don't know how to explain it except to say that in that moment I sensed that I became impregnated with this conviction that a whole geographical area the size of a city could come under the dominant influence of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so in preparation for that meeting that evening, I, I had nothing more that, to write on my notes but faith for a church 
and faith for a city. But I had no idea what I was gonna say about it. And I also knew that the, the worst thing that I could do is to come to this meeting with these seasoned leaders and tell them that suddenly we have a vision for the city. I mean, the last thing they needed is some young, excited pastor that now has a vision to take over the city. I knew that God had to speak. Well, we gathered here at this facility in what is affectionately known as the Hooksal, the corner hall. And we gathered there together that Tuesday evening. And as we started with worship, Rick Moser just led us in a time of spontaneous worship. We suddenly sensed the same experience that I had had in my study was suddenly the experience of us as a leadership group. We sensed God's presence. And we just went into a time of worship and, and it was such a precious time. And as it became quiet, one of the leaders had a message in tongues. And he spoke it out. And when he was finished, I turned to him and said, Francois, whatever is in your heart, speak that because it's God's word to us. And I'm translating from Afrikaans, but this is basically what he said. The Lord says, I'm giving you the city. Now, you have to understand, I was about to go ballistic. Because at that stage, up to that stage, we had never spoken city. We'd spoken restoration, building the church, building a healthy church, bringing, bringing this church back to being a, a role player within the context of this community, but we'd never spoken city. And one by one, the leaders confirmed that God was speaking to us about the city. I remember when everybody had finished sharing, I took my notes and said, all I could write down on my notes for this evening was, faith for a church, faith for a city. Well, that evening we discussed what would this mean and, and possibly how do we posture ourselves now as a ministry if God is speaking to us about the city. We recognized that we had no idea what that meant. We had no idea where to start. And so we made a decision that every time we will come together as a leadership, we will pray and ask God for understanding, for wisdom, and for strategy. And literally, the next two years, we didn't do much. We came together and prayed and dialogued and considered what would it look like for a church to play a role within the context of the city? That very evening, we also realized that God was not saying that everybody in the city was going to come to Doxadeo, at that stage still called Corpus Christi. We recognized that we would be a catalyst within the context of the city and that we should trust God that there would be more and more life-giving churches within the framework of this city that would serve the city well. Well, in those two years, we seriously asked God to speak to us. And God did in, in various ways. God spoke to us. One of the more distinct references that had been helpful for us was the story of the feeding of the 5,000 where we discovered five key principles that have become the guiding principles and the guiding references for this ministry. So in the following few sessions, we will be looking and unpacking these principles in terms of how we have embraced them on our journey. Well, 
After two years, this is now 1996, we felt that we now had something of a strategy. We had an understanding of what God wanted us to do. And we felt so strongly about us embarking on that, engaging it, that we decided to relaunch this church and call it Doxa Deo. Now, Doxa Deo, for those of you that have not quite figured out what it means, is the glory of God. Doxa being Greek for glory, and Deo, Latin for God. And so we fused these two languages together. I remember how we made the purists mad. I had a professor from the university phone me and ask me, do you realize what you've done? And I said, yes, very intentionally so. We decided to do that because we knew that God would use this ministry to bring different peoples together. You also have to understand that it was in that season of change and transformation into the new de democratic dispensation within South Africa. And we recognized that, that God wanted to use this ministry so that we can position ourselves to play a role within this new reality. And so, in 1996, Doxa Deo was birthed. Now, the five principles that helped us govern the process from that very time uh, are found in the story and specifically in the Mark chapter 6 rendition of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The first principle that we recognized had a bearing on us was this idea of us having to change our mentality, our way of thinking. And it was very clear that there was a distinct difference between the disciples and Jesus. The disciples were the ones that saw the challenge. They were the ones that saw that the people were hungry and they had concern. And so with their concern, they consider how they need to address this challenge, but immediately they're intimidated by their lack of resource and, and they ask this question, what difference can we make? And so when they come to Jesus, the way they want to address this problem is, let's send it away. You know, when we saw that, we saw ourselves within the context of the response of the disciples. And somehow we felt that was the response we've seen so many times within the context of church. The church is concerned. It's a concerned institution. We are concerned about the, the brokenness, the pain, the, the lostness, the the reference that we find ourselves in. But many times we are so overwhelmed, we ask the question, what difference can we make? And then we hope somewhere someone else will take care of it. But when they get to Jesus, the Bible says Jesus had compassion. And Jesus says we're going to give them something to eat. And so we suddenly realize there's this distinct difference between concern and compassion. And we coined this phrase, moving from concern to compassion. Compassion says we might not have the resources that we see right now, but we're going to get engaged and we're going to trust God that as we get engaged, God will be with us. And so we then reflected on what does it mean for us to move from concern to compassion. Well, first of all, we realized that we needed to adjust some of our theology because 
in my understanding of the world and our engagement with the world was really that you know we should try and get away from the world as far as we can. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite scriptures was, I am not of this world. And then one day I discovered that that particular text is within a bigger context. It's when Jesus prays just before he's about to die and leave this world. Jesus prays and says, Father, I pray not that you take them out of this world. And then he says, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. But protect them from the evil one. As you have sent me into this world, I have sent them into the world. And suddenly we started to recognize that we are not of the world, but we play a role within our world. And Jesus prays this very distinct portion in that whole reference when he says, Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And we suddenly realized that truth was not just designed to get people into heaven. Truth was designed to empower people to function in the world. And um, we then realized that as we started changing our understanding of our calling to the world, the second area that we needed to make an adjustment was our understanding of the church. And when is the church relevant, effective, being church? So easily church can become the place where people try and escape from the world, whereas the church is actually the place where people need to be equipped and empowered to be mobilized back into the world. And so God started speaking to us that we should look at the people who were attending in a different way. And not just celebrate that people were coming to church, but start to celebrate that people were being mobilized from the church and that God was doing things in their lives as they navigate life every day of their lives. And so we coined the phrase, city changes. And uh, can I ask how many of you are excited to be city changes? Of course, yes, you are. <laughs> and we realize that people are not coming to the program, people are the program. And we need to adjust everything we do, our preaching, our equipping, even our children's ministry, our youth ministry, everything we do, we had to flip the narrative of people just being attracted to a program, but people being empowered and going out, and we celebrate that as the program. You see, many times people are like the people of Jerusalem. They love Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city of God. It was the city that had the construct of God's way of doing things. It was Jeru Shalom. Shalom meaning wholeness, completeness, health, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility. All these wonderful concepts of wholeness. For the Jew, peace, Shalom, was not just the absence of the negative, it was the presence of the positive. There was another city in the Bible 400 times from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that was the anti-type of Jerusalem, it was Babylon. Babylon was everything that Jerusalem was not. We see how Babylon becomes something that the Jews despise. They, they couldn't believe there was this city that was constructed in a, in a man reference, not a God reference. The unthinkable, however, happens. The Babylonians come, they conquer Jerusalem, and they take the people of Jerusalem all the way to Babylon. And there they're sitting in Babylon. They can't believe they were exiles. 
The Babylonians come to them and say, hey, we hear you guys sing such beautiful songs. Will you sing us a song? The Bible says they hung up their harps on the willows and they said, by the rivers of Babylon, how can we sing a song in a strange land? And you thought Boney M wrote that. It's in the Bible. So how can we exercise our faith? How can we, how can we do what, he, what is precious to us here in Babylon? We have to find a sacred space. We have to go back to Jerusalem. It's like many people, you know, I can only exercise my spirituality in church, in, in a sacred space. But it's in that space that God speaks to them through the prophet Jeremiah. They're praying, Lord, set us free. Take us away from Babylon. And God speaks to them. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, and we often quote this verse. I know the thoughts that I think about you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, shalom. To give you a hope and a future. God says, I'm thinking thoughts of you here, right here in Babylon. And I want to give you peace. But it must have been verse 7 of Jeremiah 29 that must have rocked their world because God says, And seek the peace of the city to which I have brought you captive. Lord, you mean you're in this? You brought us all the way here to Babylon? Yes, he says, And pray for its peace, for in its peace you will have peace. God says, I have brought you here. Why, Lord? Well, how else will we bring peace, wholeness, completeness to Babylon? It's only when we take the agents of peace, the agents of shalom, and bring them into Babylon. Well, That changed so much for us when we started realizing that that when we leave these so-called sacred spaces, the gathering of people in the campuses of Doxodeo, they leave to go into their Babylon, and, and they need to be equipped. They need to be mandated to effectively engage that. And so that led us down a journey where we asked the question, how can we equip our people? And we... We recognize that there are literally three basic outcomes that we want to see in every city changer's life. This is the discipleship framework. It's knowing God, loving people, and impacting your world. And within these three vital outcomes in people's lives, We started asking the question, how can we equip people to better know God? How can we get people to have a relationship with God? And we based it around these three things of identity, intimacy, and integrity. Knowing that if we can get people to understand who they truly are, the fact that they died with Christ, they were raised with Christ, and and they are seated with Christ in heavenly places, if people understand who they are, they will have a better relationship with God. They will enjoy fellowship with God, intimacy with God, hearing the voice of God, being led by the Holy Spirit, being people that are influenced with the very presence of God, knowing that God is not far, but God has come close through redemption. And now we have the privilege of living as people who have the fullness of God within our lives. That leads to a changed life. That leads to integrity. Not because we're trying to adjust your behavior, but because you're discovering your new nature. You see, we're not trying to adjust people to a Christian culture. We're introducing people to a Christian nature. Who you truly are in Christ, relationship with God, changes the way you live. Well, that leads you to start to understand that God not only wants to work in you, He also wants to work through you. And that brings us to loving people. And if people can understand three things, compassion, calling, and contribution, 
Understanding that we are motivated by love. We are motivated by recognizing the value of every human being. At the same time, there is a calling upon every person's life. It's not just the full-time team in a church that are called. Every one is called. And once you understand your calling, you then ask, so what is, what is my contribution? What are my skills? What are my resources? What do I do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? How can I bring that into this picture? And now if you understand the motivation of compassion, the fact that you're called, and the fact that you have something to give, you start to live beyond yourself. And then it's not just loving people, but it's impacting your world. It's changing the very construct of the world that we are in. And therefore, we need to understand a worldview where we understand Christ is Lord of all. Jesus Christ is not just Lord of your life. He's not just Lord of the church. He is Lord of all. He redeemed all things. He re reconciled all things, Colossians 1 tells us. And he's Lord of all reality. When we understand he's Lord of all, he becomes Lord of education and of business and of government and of arts and media and every other space. And now we go to work as a place of calling. Our workplaces become sacred spaces. Places of ministry, places where we can represent a faithful and a fruitful presence. And then we recognize we become instruments to bring wholeness to our communities. Having a new understanding through a worldview that Christ is Lord of all, understanding your work is a place of calling. And understanding that you make a contribution to make a difference establishes you as a city changer. Our minds are renewed. We've moved from concern to compassion. That's the first principle. I believe you're excited about it. 